Right, let me um, start by reminding everybody uh, what the model of quantum computation was. In fact, I didn't finish because I started to think about what the state of a quantum computer looked like. Um, so we started with the uh, set of one to the n of classical states. So a state of a classical computer has got n bits. Each bit must be 0 or 1. That's all there is to it. Uh, I also talked about a probabilistic computer. If you don't actually know what random decisions you've taken, then a good way of representing the state, as far as you know, is as a convex combination of uh, classical states and the, the coefficients associated with each state to give you the probability that you're in that state. And then a quantum computation replace an L1 combination, or a positive uh, L1 combination of um, classical states, we are now two combination with coefficients in a complex number. To be more precise, what I actually wrote, or this is a lie, and I, what I initially, or what I wrote after somebody uh, pointed out that I made a state, a typical state of a quantum computer looks something like this. Divided by a normal, normalizing factor, which, of course, has to be that, but I forgot the uh, square root when I said that at the end of last time. So it's normalized so that uh, this vector has norm 1 in L2. Well, the particular space we're talking about, I suppose we can write L2, and that's your ground set, and that's where the coefficients lie. Let's have a few examples of no, but before actually, before I give examples, I now want to say, anybody who's seen a little bit of quantum computation will probably really dislike what I've just written there. Uh, because I'm not using the standard notation of quantum computation. Well, I am going to use the standard. Uh, so I'm now going to change from something that people who know all about quantum computation will dislike, but pure mathematicians will find sort of reasonably nice to something that quantum computing people will like, and pure mathematicians, at least initially, will dislike intensely, uh, I think. And that is, instead of writing V epsilon, I'll just write epsilon. And if you know a slight bit about quantum mechanics, that's a ket. And a bra is one of these sorts of things. And if you put them together, you get that. Now, what is all this notation? We don't need it very much. Uh, if I've got some... We're taking formal linear combinations of things here. So I take some states of a computer, and I want to take formal linear combinations of them. Uh, so to turn those states into vectors that I can attach coefficients to, I just I do that to it. So epsilon is the, is the, is the um, sequence of thoughts and ones that you might have to turn that into a vector I write. Uh, something like that. If I want, supposing I want to turn something into a dual, an element of the dual of the Hilbert space, so people like not to identify a Hilbert space with its dual because that's somehow not a natural identification or something like that. So if you want to think of um, something as a linear functional on a Hilbert space rather than a vector in the Hilbert space, you do it that way around. And then if you want the inner product of two vectors, or two states, you can just uh, put them together, and that's the inner product of x to the pi. We won't be really doing that very much. We'll just be using, on the whole, we'll just be talking about vectors and not worrying about inner products. But uh, one of the things that people like about this notation is that you can, for example, represent a rank one operator by doing things like something like this. And if you want to know how that operates on Z, you take your Z. This is a, what does this rank 1 operator do to Z? You just stick it in front of Z. And then you get the inner product of Y and Z multiplied by X. And uh, pure mathematicians have a different notation for this. They might say something like, uh, for this, they might say, this is the um, operator x tensor 
y star. And the next tensor y star applied to z gives you y star of z times x. It's just a different notation for the same sort of thing. But as I say, that's just uh, a little remark to explain why this notation isn't totally crazy. Uh, but we'll be using it. And I think uh, the normal, there's a normal process that geomathematicians have to go through, which starts off with hatred and then it becomes a kind of resigned acceptance and then ends up with something sort of possibly a little grudging affection or something. <laughs> um, I've sort of got to quite partially between resigned acceptance writing affection for it, so <laughs> myself, but uh, I wish you luck for getting that process. So, if you just look at, uh, what about, um, we had bits before, each, you had n bits, each bit could be 0 or 1, and now we're going to have things called q bits. I don't know whether you can really give a formal definition of a bit, of qubit. I just think of a qubit as a bit when I'm talking about quantum computation. Um, so, let's write down some states. Suppose you've just got one qubit, then what will a state look like? Well, the qubit can take value 0 or 1, um, and so a typical state would be able to form alpha. to 1 with um, alpha squared plus beta squared equals 1. Think about how if I've got a quantum computer with two qubits, uh, then what can the possible states be? Well, <coughs> we have uh, the basic states, so there'll be things like 0, uh, 0, 0, 1. 1 naught and 1 1 and so now a state of a 2 qubit quantum computer will be something of the form alpha plus down plus delta with uh, again the sum of the squares equaling 1 and in general I could rewrite this thing up here as a typical state being of the form sigma lambda epsilon uh, epsilon with sigma lambda epsilon squared equals 1. Now, you could just say this is a Hilbert space um, where the, of dimension 2 to the n, where because 2 to the n is a power of 2, it's somehow natural to index the basis vectors with binary sequences of length n. But actually there's slightly more to it than that um, because the set 0, 1 to the n can be given all sorts of structures. And in fact a good way of thinking about uh, this space here is it's a tensor product of n two-dimensional copies of little l2. Just to make that reasonably explicit, if there are people who uh, are totally happy with tensor products, <coughs> let's look at this two-dimensional case. I want to see how we can we can think of this as a just a different notation for the tensor product of two two-dimensional vector spaces. So both one, let's uh, say that the first vector space has a basis, and I'm going to call the vectors in that basis naught one and. 1, 1. So those, I've just put this little subscript 1 to say that's the <coughs> first vector space that I happen to be talking about. And I, so I've got these funny names for the vectors in the first little L2. And then I've got 0, 2 and 1, 2. And if I take a tensor product of these, what a basis will take the form, well, it'll be all things, I'll just write down the basis of it. basis of a tensor product of 
the vector space that had this as its basis vectors, and the vector space that had this as its vector base, uh, as its basis vectors. Again, try not to think of naught as sort of taking a value. This is just a name of a vector. Um, and after a while, we could say, let's not bother with a tensor product notation. Let's just write it like this. Instead of, uh, let's do this one. Instead of writing it as naught ten, uh, tensor 1, 2, we'll just write it like this. Naught 1, 1, 2. I'll just stick them next to each other in the convention as if I do that. It's a tensor product. The next stage of the process, I could say, well, instead of writing this 1 and 2, I mean, I'll just always put the 1, 1 over there and put the 2, 1 there, so I might as well just write it like this. And then the next step is, well, I really need to write that. So actually, sometimes all these things are useful. So I will have, I don't know whether I'll use all four, but I, in principle, have four interchangeable pieces of notation that all mean the same thing. I've got this, 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 and this. So here is, for example, a way of writing a state, just one particular state. Let's consider the state 1 over 2 to the n over 2 sum over all epsilon. epsilon. First of all, let's just check that that's a valid state. And it is because the sum of the coefficients, the sum of the squares of the coefficients, is 2 to the n times 1 over 2 to the n, which gives us 1, and this range is over, yeah, because this range is over all 0, 1 strings of length n. But we could also write this as, we can decompose this as superposition of naught and 1, and I've done that for all the qubits. Why is that the same thing? Because this is just this tensor product thing, so a typical term here will take a, a naught or a 1 out of each bracket, product them all together to get something like, uh, if I use that notation, uh, and divide by 2 to the n over 2. So it's just another way of writing things, and, some, and as we'll see later on, being able to think of a state as uh, a tensor product of states is a very nice thing to do. However, if you know anything about tensor products, you know that um, there's a sort of old undergraduate trap to fall into to think that every element of the tensor product V tensor W must have the form little v tensor little w for some v in capital V and w in capital w. And that's far from true. In, uh, the, the general element has to be a linear combination of such things. And of course, exactly the same happens in uh, quantum computation because it, it is a tensor product. So what I've written here, which is uh, happens to be of the form a state concerning the first qubit tensor, a state concerning the second qubit, all the way up to the last one, is a very, very special form of a state. And this is, we could call this a separable state. an example of a separable state. So a separable state would be anything of the form, uh, let's write it in some notation, so the big product over all i of alpha i naught, so i equals 1 to n alpha i naught plus beta i 1, where we've all, always got alpha i squared plus beta i squared plus 1. So those are very, very special forms of state if those were the only states that you could get in a quantum computer, you could simulate your quantum computer with a classical computer quite easily. That's been proved. And it's a sort of exercise, really. So the whole power of quantum computation comes from the fact that not all states are separable in this way. Um, and a state that's not separable is called entangled. Now let me give you the simplest entangled state, or one of the simplest entangled states. Uh, and to do it, I will just think, go back, go back to tensor product of two vector spaces. What's the easiest way of producing something that's not of this form? You just take a basis, say you've got a basis here, E1, E2, and a basis F1, F2. So you take E1 tensor F1 
plus e to the tensor f2, and you just can't write that as a product of one thing, product of another. So the exact corresponding example here would be something like that. That would be a good example of an entangled state. This particular state, I'm sure the notation is a little bit different, but it underlies, you may have heard of the EPR paradox, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. Um, the idea is, let's just think what would happen if we did a measurement. I, perhaps I'll remind you what happens with a measurement. Supposing I measure a qubit, so what I do is I run my quantum computation it's in some funny superposition, I then actually look at the ith bit, let's say i1, I'll look at the first bit, then that's always going to give me some deterministic value. It'll either, if it's a physical thing, I'll look at it, it'll either be a 1 or a 0. When I look at it, it's not going to say uh, I'm 1 over root 2, 1 plus 1 over root 0, it has to be one or the other. So what happens to the rest of the state after you've done that measurement, after you've looked at the first bit? Well, it just does the most natural thing it could possibly do. It sort of projects onto the subspace of uh, L2, of, of this uh, Hilbert space that's consistent with your observation. In other words, um, it takes, I've lost it now, I want the version with it, it takes this sigma lambda epsilon, epsilon and then maps to, uh, I wrote this last time actually, so it maps the sigma of all epsilon such that epsilon 1, if, the, if, if I've got a 1, Epsilon 1 equals 1, uh, lambda epsilon, epsilon divided by sum, epsilon a equals 1, lambda epsilon squared, to the half. So you say, you, you set all the bits where, that are inconsistent with this observation to zero, and uh, so they project not quite right, but they, all the ones that are inconsistent to zero, and then you normalize the rest, so it goes back to having L2 norm equal to 1. And the probability that you'll get 1 is this. Uh, so over here, supposing we take a measurement of the first qubit, then what's the probability that we'll get 0? Just before I say that, I've got to tell you the story of the supervision that I gave recently, because uh, it's somehow strangely relevant to this. So one of my supervisees came along, and there was a question about Rouchet's theorem and finding zeros in various quadrants of the half plane. And she came up with, a, you were supposed to prove that there's exactly one zero in all four quadrants of the complex plane. And her argument went like this. There are two zeros in the right half plane, and two zeros in the left half plane. There are also two zeros in the upper half plane, and two zeros in the lower half plane. Done. <laughs> and uh, so I hope you can, well, this sort of almost, the form of this tells you that you can't do it. So I drew a picture like that and she said, oh yes. And, uh, and here, um, what is the probability that we will measure a naught if we measure the first qubit? Well, we just, what have we got? Let's just write the vector like this. We've got a 1 over root 2 there. 1 over root 2 there. If we take a measurement, um, then what's the, we're measuring the first qubit, so that's the sort of x coordinate. So I want to know, am I in this half or am I, am I in this half? So to work out the probability on this half, I just add the squares of all the coefficients and I get a half. So the one in, there's a 50 50 chance that I'll be in the left, uh, left half and a 50 50 chance that I'll be in the right half. So for the 50% chance, I'll get. The left half, 50% chance I get the left. The right half. If I get the left half, it'll collapse to something that's just uh, what it was, proportional to what it was. It's a zero on the right hand side and proportional to what it was on the left hand side, which means it must be one, not more. Than one. And if I've got the right half, in other words, if the first qubit had measured one, then it would have become naught, naught. North one. It would have picked out the right half and normalized to make it have norm one. That's what a measurement does. Um, now I suppose I do a second measurement, this time of the 
y coordinate, or, or the second qubit. Well, if the first qubit, when I measured it, gave me a naught, then I'm over here. So when I measure the second qubit, I'm now completely stuck in the bottom half plane. So it's, it's guaranteed to give me a 1. If the first measurement gave a 1, then that sort of collapses things. So the second measurement is now guaranteed to be 1. And similarly, if the first measurement had, so that was a 0. Sorry. If the first measurement had been 0, the second one was guaranteed to be 0. If the first measurement is a 1, then the second measurement is guaranteed to be a 1. Um, and what's the EPR paradox? Well, the EPR paradox is you take this um, state, and then you send the first qubit off to someone called Alice, traditionally, and then you send the second qubit off to Bob, also traditionally, and Alice and Bob live such a long way apart that it takes speed of light, it takes light a noticeable amount of time to get from Alice to Bob. Then Alice makes a measurement, and at some, they, they sort of decided in advance at what time they will take their measurements. And so Alice says, I'll make a measurement. Uh, actually, I don't know whether and then quite makes sense. They're separated. Uh, whatever we do, Alice and Bob make measurements um, sufficiently like that. But there's no, no signal can pass from Alice to Bob before Bob makes his measurement. Nevertheless, the prediction of quantum mechanics will be that, uh, for this simple reason, that whatever measurement Alice makes, Bob will make the same measurement. And, well, people didn't like that, or Einstein didn't like that, because that suggested if quantum mechanics was genuinely probabilistic, then somehow making the measurement should be causing something to happen. But if the same thing has to happen to Bob, that suggests that some signal has had to pass from Alice to Bob faster than the speed of light. Um, and there are, there, are, there are developed to this Bell's paradox and things. And there are two very natural principles that one might want to hold on to. One is locality, which says you can't pass signals faster than the speed of light, and the other is generally there's realism that says there must be some reality about uh, what's going on underneath before you make the measurement. Um, and those two, it turns out, with little simple phenomena like this, you can actually show that they can't both be true. <coughs> um, anyway, it may be puzzling from a philosophical point of view, but just from a pure mathematical point of view, there's nothing particularly difficult about this state, or what happens when you measure it. It's just uh, quite what happens <coughs> in the real world. It's a little bit, has puzzled people, and a lot of people have written about it. A great thing. But we can forget about all that. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a lot of what we're, uh, quantum mechanics that we can forget about. We can also forget about measurements being eigenvalues of emission operators and things like that. We don't, we don't have to worry about that. We just uh, do what I've done. You say, I'll take half the cube, look at the total sum of the squares, of, and that's going to be the probability that I get that half, and then I make that lot zero, and I'm in this half, and then normalize. So that's all that a measurement is from our point of view. Um, now, I've not said the most important thing about quantum computation. <coughs> how do you actually compute things? It's one thing to have a computer that's in a state, but how do you change the state of a computer? Well, in classical computation, what you do is. Um, Obviously, it's a, well, particularly the reversible thing that I talked about last time. We were thinking of, a, of an operation as being some function or a bijection from 0, 1 to the n, 0, 1 to the n. But obviously, we don't just take any old bijection from 0, 1 to the n to 0, 1 to the n. Otherwise, you could just say, I'll take a bijection that uh, does, my, does the entire computation for me all in one step or something like that. The whole point about um, computers is that what they're good at is very, very simple. It's doing over and over again lots of very, very simple things. And by simple, the normal meaning would be just things that you can do to about two bits at a time or something like that. You, you focus your attention on two bits, you do some operation uh, depending on what those two bits are, and then you move on to some other bits and so on. So um, a classical computation has to be a composition of a large number of 
very simple operations that apply just to a small number of bits. And the same the principle applies to quantum computation, but uh, what is the quantum analog of bijections from 0, 01 to n to 0, 01 to n? Um, well, we take our Hilbert space, what, and we've got vectors of norm 1. We want to send vectors of norm 1 to vectors of norm 1. And uh, there, are, there is a class of functions that uh, is well known to do that, and that's the unitary maps. So the basic operations of a quantum computation Precisely what a simple unitary map is, I'm just going to give a few examples. Let's begin with a very simple one. We'll take a not gate. So I, I, I fix on a qubit and I just want to change it from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. That way of talking makes it sound just like a classical computation. Um, but what I'm doing there is telling you what I do to an element of the basis. So if I happen to have um, that basis element, and I'm doing a knot gate on the first qubit, then that will map to 1 0 0. And if I have, say, 1 0 1, that will map to 0 0 1, and so on. Um, so and moreover, if I had, say, alpha times that plus beta times that, it would go to alpha times this plus beta times this. So in order to say what a quantum operation does, I can say what it does to one of these classical basis states and uh, then extend linearly. So, um, just classical, then the only ones would be the identity and flipping the two around. I've just got uh, two possibilities for the first qubit. But in the quantum world, I can get anything in between. So let me just show you how to, this is quite like this, it's a square root of not. It's not really a unique square root of not, but uh, I'll do naught maps to 1 over root 2. 0 plus 1, and 1 maps to 1 over root 2, 0 minus 1. Well, let's represent that as a matrix, it's much nicer. So, well, what is the matrix of that? It's just uh, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, minus 1 over root 2, and I hope that squares to it doesn't. It's a square of that. It's a bottom of the square root of not, actually, after all. But we could have got the square root of not by probably putting a minus over here or something. 
What does that square to? Give me 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Yeah, it's not quite such an interesting thing. Now, just check. Now, what do, actually, what does 1, 0, 0, minus 1 do? Well, it just takes. Is that right? <coughs> or is it just the identity? Just the identity. Okay, that's rather disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I could have got the square root of naught. But actually, this is the one I want to talk about because uh, forget the, I leave it as an exercise to get the square root of a knot gate. This has got a different. This is called a Hadamard gate, and Hadamard gates are rather useful things. Um, here's a reason that they're quite useful. In a quantum computation, you sometimes want to get very, very rapidly from a state, from a computational basis state, to a state that's sort of evenly spread around all possible computational basis states. So you might want to produce, you might want to get very, very rapidly from this state to 1 over 2 to the n over 2 sum over all epsilon. Epsilon. Now, how can you do that? Well, what does this do to the first qubit? It replaces it by um, 1 over root, well, it's over here. It replaces it by 1 over square root of 2, 0 plus 1. So if I compose some Hadamard gates, one for every single qubit, then if I start with 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, which I will now think of as the product like that, then applying a Hadamard gate in turn to each qubit converts uh, each one of those into one of those, so I get uh, 1 over 2 to the n over 2 times, um, so well, I get this um, thing that I wrote over here, and uh, that is exactly spread things evenly out over all the qubits. If I'd started off with a different um, computational basis state, I would have got <coughs> some minus signs around the place here as well. And I would have got another state. So I'd have some plus or minuses here. What would happen if we measured? What would be the probability? Supposing I measured uh, each qubit in turn and uh, thereby collapsed the whole thing down to a single point of the cube. What's the probability that I would get a particular epsilon um, the answer would be 1 over 2 to the n. And that's the case whatever the signs. So does that mean, I just want to draw attention here to the fact that if you measure everything, you somehow get the same result. And yet these are extremely different states because you've got very different phases. And how does the difference show up? The difference shows up because you can apply unitary maps such as the inverse of this. And if you do that, and you can bring everything back up just to a simple computational basis state, which will depend very much on the phases that you had here. If you had just a, a completely random collection of signs, you won't be able to do that, but if you've got very special ones that arise from these Hadamard <coughs> gates, then you can collapse it back up again. And that's actually what's so good about a quantum computation. What it gives you this possibility of taking a simple computational basis state sort of spreading it around, doing some stuff to it, and then unspreading it, and getting an answer that uh, depends on some property of what you started with. I'll say a lot more about that, but um, the, I'll just mention now, so you can bear it in mind, the thing that really distinguishes between quantum computation and probabilistic computation. And that is that when you apply a unitary map, um, you can well, we've already seen, actually, that this, when squared, gives me the identity. So if I start with naught, I apply a Hadamard gate once, I get this. But if I apply a Hadamard gate a second time, I get back to naught again. Which means that something that was sort of spread out managed to get put back together again. And that depended crucially on cancellation. When, I, uh, when you apply the Hadamard gate again to this, you get a half naught plus one plus a half, naught minus one, and the two one bits cancel out. 
By contrast, if you've got a probabilistic com uh, computation, as soon as you've started spreading things out and introduce a bit of uncertainty, if it's a um, reversible, in other words, if it's a, a bijection that you're applying, um, that you're just probabilistically choosing what the bijection is, there's no way of getting it back. A convex combination of genuine convex combinations that haven't got uh, just one in one place and zero everywhere else can't get you back to something that is one in one place and zero everywhere else. So that's the really enormous difference between quantum computation and probabilistic computation. Um, one other type of gate that I would like to mention now was a rather general phenomenon called a controlled gate. So supposing you've already got a gate that does one thing. So supposing I've got some gate that applies a function to uh, a couple of qubits here. And I want some kind of if-then step. I want to say if one thing happens, then I'll do one operation. And if that thing doesn't happen, I won't do that operation. Then an, I can take another qubit here, and I can just say if that qubit is 1, I'll do the operation which was a bijection, and if it's naught, then I won't do it. Let's just think of it in the three-bit case. Supposing I've got an operation that I can do to pairs of qubits, and I introduce a third qubit. So now my space, or my computational basis, is functions on three-dimensional cube. Uh, supposing I want to use the first bit uh, I.e. the x-direction as the control. So I want to say, I'll do the y-z operation, but only if x is 1. Well, what that's saying is, when x is 0, I just leave this lot alone. So if I started with alpha, beta, gamma, delta here, it will remain alpha, beta, gamma, delta. But over here, I'll apply the unitary map that I had before. That's clearly still a unitary map. It's just got a matrix that looks like this, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then the unitary map that I used for the two-bit thing in the other half. And uh, controlled gates are extremely useful in quantum computations, and we'll, we'll be using them. That's why I wanted to mention them. And also, I should mention that all the reversible computation things that we talked about, you can do in a quantum computation, because those are just given by permutation matrices and those are obviously unitary. So if I take what's a reversible computation, so I take three bits, actually, I just want to give you a little, maybe slightly more of a view of what's going on. Um, by just thinking what the matrix of a simple unitary map looks like, So supposing my operation is something that's applied to the first two bits, two qubits, then you might think, oh right, we're talking about a, uh, well, the two bits can have states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So you might think we're talking about um, a 4 by 4 unitary matrix. The answer is yes, we sort of are. But that 4 by 4 matrix is tensored with a whole lot of other stuff. So supposing I do some operation, let's just imagine that I've got, a, I've got n qubits, and I do a Hadamard gate just on, uh, well, that's just one qubit. OK, well, let's do a Hadamard gate just on the first qubit. Why not? So what's its matrix going to look like? Well, if I write the basis out in this order, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, then I'll get to here, and then I'll have one more, 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 one more, more, one, and so on. So I've got some big square matrix. The Hadamard gate will say um, that normal goes to some superposition of normal with one more. So we'll get, let's put a one over root two out, out here. I'll get one, 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 <coughs> minus one. And then this one's going to be paired off with this one. So I get 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And in general, all going to end up with identity, 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 minus identity. That's 1 over the square root of 2. 
And similarly, if I've got a two qubit operation, then typically, and if it applies just to the first two qubits, then it's going to be some uh, four by four unitary matrix tensored with the identity. So you take your unitary matrix, whatever it is, and then you just put identities by every single coefficient to get some two to the n by two to the n matrix from your two by two matrix. Okay, I mean that's just saying what it means to tensor a linear map or not, and the linear map what happens to the matrix. But nevertheless, I don't know, it's somehow helpful to think, think about these things in, in various different ways. I think I'm now going to uh, stop talking about quantum computation for a bit and talk a little bit about um, the problem of factorizing. Because at the moment, uh, it's not clear why quantum computation would be good for this particular problem of factorizing. So I'm going in two directions. One is, let's see what quantum computation can do for us. And the other is, we want to factorize. It would be enough to do blah, blah, blah. It would be enough to do blah, blah, blah. Um, and we hope that at some stage we meet in the middle and say, wow, with a quantum computation we can actually factorize. And I'm just going to jump from one to the other. So I've focused on doing the forwards direction now, but in order to give, give a bit more motivation, and I want to start doing things backwards. I won't have time to do all that much in this lecture, but I want to uh, reduce the problem of factorizing to problems that are more amenable to things that can be done with a quantum computer. I might as well give the game away slightly. Uh, it turns out that the thing that the real thing that quantum computers are very, very good at, and I've given a slight hint of this in my remarks already, is doing Fourier transforms, or discrete Fourier transforms. So Fourier transforms are a classic instance where you do a Fourier transform, it takes something that's very, very pointy, this is sort of the uncertainty principle, and spreads it all over the place. And the inverse Fourier transform will take something that's spread all over the place if it arose from something that was very pointy, which is not at all, not all the case, uh, usually isn't the case, but if it is the case, and can make it pointy again. And that's going to be extremely useful to us. Uh, so the aim here is going to be to try to get from the problem of how to factorize to some problem that we can solve if we've got a quantum computer that will allow us to do super fast Fourier transforms. You might say, actually, that, uh, isn't there something called the fast Fourier transform? Uh, yes, there is. That takes time n log n. However, we're talking about exponential dimensional space here, and n log n just ain't good enough <laughs> if n is already exponentially large. So I'm to, to, these Fourier transforms are going to be, well, faster than ought to be possible. I'll have some remarks about that. <laughs> I mean, sort of, we're roughly speaking, saying we can take a Fourier transform in log n steps, which doesn't sort of necessarily sound very plausible. Uh, but there, are, one has to qualify all that, that, that statement. In, in the textbook by Nielsen and Twang, which I happen to have here, how much of a shirt here? Recommended book. It's recommended if you want to become extremely knowledgeable about quantum computation. It's not absolutely recommended if, if you're trying to find a minimal route to understanding uh, Shaw's algorithm, which doesn't get done until page 200 and something. Um, but a lot of I mean, you just have to work out what you need to read up to that point. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a nicely written book. Uh, and a pretty standard book, I would say, like that. Um, Yeah, so you might think if you can do incredibly fast uh, Fourier transforms with a quantum computer, why aren't people getting terribly excited? Why, can't, why doesn't that mean you could do massively fast multiplications, for example? And the answer is, it's all to do with the measurement. And <coughs> you have to. You can do a very fast Fourier transform, but then it's just sort of spread out all over this. Uh, it's a superposition of states, and you can't actually sort of get your hands on this entire function, you can just do little measurements of it. So finding ways of using this super fast quantum computation is a non-trivial business. 
Um, right, so let's just do the first production. So we've got a number n, and we'd like to factorize it. So the first thing is going to be Observation that if you can find a non trivial square root of 1 mod n, then you can factorize n. Well, let's first say what a non trivial square root of 1 mod n is. Take n equals 15, say, a favorite uh, composite number. Um, then can you find a square root of 1 that's not plus or minus 1 mod 15? Little exercise? <laughs> yes, indeed. And um, so let's suppose we've got a square root of, just to convince you that there is such a thing as a non-trivial square root of 1, um, at least for one example, I'll talk about that in just a moment, but let's suppose we've got one. Supposing x squared is congruent to 1 mod n, then you do the only thing that's reasonable to do, you know that x minus 1 times x plus 1 is congruent to 0, in other words x minus 1 times x plus 1 is a multiple of n. Now, if n divides x minus 1 times x plus 1, then um, it's got to have a common factor with x minus 1 or a common factor with x plus 1. And if n has got a common factor with some number m, some non-trivial common factor. Notice that x plus 1 and x minus 1 are less than m, so this is not going to be... Well, there's one thing that could go wrong, but uh, we'll come to that in a minute. Well, no, let's come to it now. The, the thing that could go wrong is if we have got a trivial square root of 1, in which case x minus 1 might be 0, or x plus 1 might be 0 mod n, in which case uh, we don't get anything at all. But if we've got a non-trivial square root of 1, that's not plus or minus 1, then we've got um, some m with a non-trivial factor in common with n, and then, we can, uh, then we're in business because you just apply Euclid's algorithm, which is a very, very efficient thing to do, find the highest common factor of these two, and you've got a non-trivial factor of n, and then you induct. Um, so um, if you can find a non-trivial square root of n, then you can find a, a non-trivial factor of n. Why should there be non-trivial square roots of n? Let's just talk about the case where n is, because this is the case that's of interest for the RSA algorithm. But this discussion generalizes quite easily. But supposing n equals pq, then when is x squared congruent to 1? It's congruent to 1 if and only if x squared is congruent to 1 mod p and x squared is congruent to 1 mod q. Now, how can that happen? Well, you need x to be plus or minus 1 mod p and plus or minus 1 mod q. And by the Chinese remainder theorem, all four of those uh, possibilities can happen. You can have x being 1. So well, the, the trivial ones would be when x squared is 1 mod p and x squared is 1 mod q, and when x squared is 1 mod p and uh, minus 1 mod p and minus 1 mod q. Those would be the two trivial square roots of... Uh, 1 mod n, but the two non-trivial ones would be when x squared is minus 1 mod p and 1 mod q, or 1 mod p and minus 1 mod q. Let's just check that in. When n is 15, we had 4, which was 1 mod 3 and minus 1 mod 5, and minus 4 is minus 1 mod 3 and 1 mod 5. So uh, when n is a product of two primes, there are four non-trivial square roots of 1, uh, sorry, four square roots of 1, of which two are non-trivial. So the next question is, how do you get hold of a non-trivial square root of 1? And I haven't got very much time. I'll just give a quick uh, preview of it, but we'll do that a bit more next time. So the, the rough idea is you just pick any old w. Somehow, using some quantum magic, you find the order of w mod n. 
So you find the smallest r such that w to the r is congruent to 1. If you're lucky, r is even. And if r is even, then we take r, w to the r over 2. That's going to be a square root of 1. Because we chose r to be the order, this won't be 1. It might be minus 1. But if you're lucky, it's not minus 1. And this argument shows that the chances of being lucky uh, will be at least 50% or something like that. So if you're unlucky and you find, oh, we've done all this quantum computation which took years to build and everything, and you just managed to find a square root minus 1, well, you just have to hope that it wasn't a sort of machine that destroys itself after one use or something. <laughs> And then you keep on going, you pick random w's. So actually, I should just make a general remark. With quantum computation, there is a probabilistic element to it. When you make a measurement, weird things could happen. You have to set it up so that with probability three quarters or something like that, at the end of the day, you'll get what you want. And then if you don't get what you want, you just run the experiment over and over again. until you. And then if you run it enough times, then the chances that you won't manage to factorize your number n can be made as small as you like, very, very, very quickly. Okay, so I'll say more about uh, how we're going to find. It. So, in a sense, I've boiled everything down to how do you find the order of a typical element in a multiplicative group mod n. And by the way, if you pick a random w, it might not be co-prime to n, but then you're extremely pleased because you could use it, you could have it, but that's not a problem. Okay, carry on next time.